So today we're going to have uh, a lecture that follows on to some extent with what we've been saying before, but uh, we move away from uh, kind of political developments in the sense that we are going to be talking of um, about energy. And it is quite important because uh, there is a lot of literature, especially uh, that produced in the United States of America, which identifies a lot of Central Asia's international appeal with the very vast resources that are included into the subsoil, particularly of Kazakhstan and Kyrgyzstan. What we are, uh, what we're doing today really is uh, trying to go a little bit beyond what this uh, superficial, if you want, assessment is. And we're going to discuss in deeper, in a deeper way, um, what the energy security of Central Asia really is. And uh, this is a lecture which is somewhat also relevant for Russia because Russia as Kazakhstan and Turkmenistan is a country that uh, is a main exporter of both oil and gas. Uh, although Russia has got a much larger um, resource pool than these two states, but the kind of issues, the kind of processes, the kind of actors which we're going to describe in the next 30, 40 minutes are very important for Russia too, because uh, you could see uh, replicating in the Central Asian context a few uh, phenomena that are also present in the Russian energy landscape. And as usual, if you want to have question, want to interrupt me during the, the lecture, you can add a comment on the chat. I am not sure whether I can see the chat with the video share, but I think I can, or otherwise just interrupt me and I'll just explain what we're gonna have. So now on the right hand side, you see uh, energy refinery, I think, in Western Kazakhstan, and you can kind of uh, recognize the, both the cold of that part of Kazakhstan, this is all snow, but also how flat it is. So you, you would realize that there is that kind of geographical context in which this picture is taken away. But uh, there are two interlinked objectives in today's seminar. And the first one, we're going to outline what are the main um, elements, the main constituents of Central Asia energy mix, which is the total, the ensemble of resources that are used to power the Central Asian economy. So uh, petrol for transportation, uh, gas for reheating, uh, coal for industrial development, coal for uh, generational electricity, but also more renewable like solar or uh, in the case of Tajikistan and Kyrgyzstan, um, hydropower. And then we will also have um, a more, if you want, a more comprehensive discussion of the political implication of this particular energy security confirmation and we will configuration and we will connect what are the elements of Central Asia's energy security with those that we identified as being the key elements of regime security. So to see how having or not having resources has actually impacted on these states uh, capacity to, when well, those regimes, capacity to maintain control over the local politics. Uh, there's going to be, and this is the first slide here, there's going to be a particular um, theoretical, if you want, uh, lens that we're going to apply, and it is that of the Rantia state. So Rantia state, which is uh, a, a, a theoretical framework used particularly with particular relevance in the case of the Arab Gulf states and uh, well, particularly or in that context, because it, it is very useful, very useful to detect who is going to be um, 
who is able to, uh, I'm sorry, manage that state, manage that state with that. So pretty much the Ranty state is a definition which is used to explain uh, the political behavior and the economic choices made by the elite who run states that are incredibly rich in one or more particular resources to the extent to which the great majority of the GDP growth, the employment base and the top fiscal revenues of the states are dependent by the um, revenues generated by the export of that particular resource. It's not just about having the resource. It's also by being capable to export it, make it the most important entry in your budget. And today, you know, it's 2021, we are used to consider rentier states, uh, mostly you know, the, you know, Qatar, the UAE, Saudi Arabia particularly, uh, because in our historical time, oil, hydrocarbon, oil, oil and natural gas are the uh, most, if you want, most valuable commodities in the, in the world. But it is not just about oil and gas. Historically, we have examples of Ramtia state based non, on non-oil economy. And again, the, the case here is the um, Abu Dhabi Emirates that before finding oil was, it was surviving on the export of the pearls that the divers would get in the sea. So that was their main resource. But we also have, at this, in this day and age, a significant range of countries in Sub-Saharan Africa, like Botswana, for instance, that uh, have a anti economy based on the export of diamonds and other, and, and other, and other stones. So this is something which you need to consider. Today, we you usually associate around the economy with the export of um, oil and gas, but it doesn't have to be always the case. You can have around the economy beyond hydrocarbons. And that's important because what defines the economy is not very much having oil and gas, but it's having this externally generated rent that comes from, la from the um, export of a single resource. So obviously when you have these economies that are uh, focused on the extraction and the export of this one single resource, you have a whole series of markers or factors that define what modern rentierism is. And of course, this kind of preliminary slide, it's important because we're going to understand very much uh, Kazakhstan and Turkmenistan as northern Middle Eastern rentier states. So, uh, Talking about the markets that we have, uh, the scholars who write about these issues are very, um, well, usually admit that there is not an ideal Ramte state. There is no state that actually ticks all the boxes which we're going to mention now. But what we have here really is um, a series of states located in that are considered to be the most, the closest to the ideal type, which I'm going to describe now. So one thing which we're going to, uh, well, one key markers in the structure of the modern Ramtia state is the creation of uh, elite patents and social structure. So usually, especially if you look at states that are located in the, in the Middle East, in the Arab Middle East, you do have this particular uh, situation in which mm, a lot of uh, there is this particular social pact in which through the internal exploitation of the rent uh, citizens of the states receive uh, a significant network of subsidies but they are usually willing to give away their political rights so if, if you look in the Middle East in the Arab Middle East particularly in the Arab Gulf, even more particularly, you would realize that there is no such thing as uh, electoral participation because the elections are pu purely consultative. Because the elite 
that runs the Ranti estate in the Middle East is uh, has put itself into a non-challengeable uh, position of, of, poly, of monopoly. And here in, in the Middle East, we have this particular, uh, if you want, coincidence between familiar links and elite control. So you would see uh, in Saudi Arabia, but also in Qatar, in, in, uh, in the Arab Emirates and Kuwait, this structure in which you will have this family controlling a very large network of associates who managed to um, employ, to use the, the rent ex, uh, generated by the export of oil and gas in particular, and um, dominate the, uh, the political life of this country without really asking for, for any kind of consultative uh, situation from the population. So you also have in this, with having such a dominating elite who rules over the country with a non-democratic outlook in mind, you also have, uh, you establish a particularly important premium on what um, citizenship is. So you would see that in the case of Saudi Arabia, uh, Arab Emirates, you do have uh, an incredibly important assigned to having a Saudi passport, an Emirati passport, which are very difficult to get if you're not from there. Because being part of the, the, national, the citizenship actually allows you to uh, being within the Ranti system. And in turn, it creates a particularly uh, soft position for the local population in which there is no such competition for the kind of jobs that they, they are able to have which in turn determines the, the creation of a very particular social structure in which in the Arab states, but this is also true to Russia, at least in the 1990s and 2000, you have the local population, but also have two different strata. One, which is usually assigned by qualified foreigners, usually from the West, who help running the oil economy, the non-oil economy, uh, in expanding the financial um, uh, horizons of these states, their financial markets, they are open to globalization and they support in a kind of second in line role, the, the ruling elite. And then you have a third level, if you want, of migrants from poorer countries, the Philippines, uh, India, Pakistan, who are doing all the menial jobs, drivers, nurses, uh, working in restaurants. And this is something which we've seen also in Russia where you have this incredibly large migrants from Central Asia who are running the uh, well, uh, restaurants. I mean, my experience in Moscow has been driven around just by Kazakhs and Kyrgyz. So that, that's how it is. So in creating this particular social structure, you are uh, establishing a, a particularly complex um, social part in Ramti estate, something which is very important as we will see later on in the case of Turkmenistan. The economic structure of these economies is very much confined to their capacity to exploit their um, the rent. So a Ramti estate is economically powerful only to the extent to which its elite is, is capable to make sure that the rent that is generated by the export of this resource is something that is constant, is affordable, and is secure in its patterns of export. So you would see that here we're talking about a one resource economy, economy that is based on the export of one single resource, be it diamonds, be it gold, be it oil and gas, and it's got a particularly unsophisticated uh, economic structure beyond the non-resource economy, but in which the revenues, which is the rent, are the more important, the most critical element of the entire economic structure. What you could see is that when it comes to the former Soviet Union, the part of the world where you're located now, you would see that there is no, there is no such thing as an, a totally ranty state. We have Turkmenistan and Azerbaijan being very close to having this kind of rentieristic outlook, very because they, they, they rely 
reliance on the rent of the rent of the export of oil and gas and gas to Turkmenistan is uh, more extreme. And then you have Kazakhstan which is somewhat somewhere in the middle where you have the rise of a well, very slow rise, but nonetheless of a non oil economy and Russia, which even though is the largest exporter of oil, of oil and gas combined in the world, cannot be regarded as a rentier state because the Russian economy is more sophisticated if we compare it to either countries with similar res resource largesse, i.e. Saudi Arabia, or with post-Soviet countries that we do have uh, in the rest of Eurasia. That would be Azerbaijan, Kazakhstan, and Turkmenistan. Now, this is important, this kind of preliminary slide, because it gives you a bit of a reference to understand how this is what we're going to talk. And of course, uh, the kind of rentierism which we've seen in Central Asia, now I'm going to shift mostly on the region of our interest, is a kind of un unsophisticated rentierism. We don't really see uh, Kazakhstan and Turkmenistan engaging in uh, sustained debates about the non-oil economy or the post-oil economy, because there will be one day in which we will no longer have oil and gas. We don't see uh, Kazakhstan and Turkmenistan intervening in any kind of uh, pro-diversification arguments, so building a non-oil economy, expanding resources. So, and in, in especially also in the case of Turkmenistan, we see no attempt to establish a sovereign oil function, so sovereign gas fund, to administer the rent generated by the natural gas export in a more transparent way. So, in that sense, Turkmenistan is an extremely unsophisticated rentier state very similar for outlook and for behavior to Saudi Arabia in the 1930s. So we're talking about a non-evolved rentier state. But let's for a second, let's now move on a couple of slides which really tell you where, uh, how these structures, how these rentier uh, states are done. So first of all, using this map that comes from um, Katsmunai gas, which is the, the Kazakh uh, the Kazakhstani oil and gas company, uh, well, oil company, I should say, we are gonna identify graphically for you uh, where the location of the um, Kazakhstani reserves really is. And as you can see, the majority of the uh, resources, the reserves, the wells, if you want, the, the fields, is located in the western part of Kazakhstan. Now, this is a particularly big state, not as big as Russia, but very large nonetheless. So uh, the location of where these fields are located, and most importantly, the fact that unlike the Gulf state, Kazakhstan and Central Asia more in general does not have address, does not have access, sorry, to open seas, constrain your capacity to exploit your revenues to your capacity to build pipelines, long, large scale pipelines, because the markets to which Kazakhstan want to export be on the West European Union and on the East Republic of China, sorry, People's Republic of China, are relatively distant, which has got two implications. The first one is that since Kazakhstan was part of the Soviet Union, you have an already established pipeline network and network of um, of shipping, which I am going to be, uh, as now, they are, are particularly working in, in that area over here, eh, which I, I'm highlighting now. So in a sense, you would have the Kazakhstan, if you the Caspian Sea, being uh, exported to the Russia pipeline network once they get to uh, the Russian port on the Caspian Sea. And that has worked for a long time because you had this particular integrated infrastructure network, which was meant to operate as part of the Soviet Union when the Soviet Union was existing. But then the main issue was that when Russia continually expanded its export average, its export quotas to the European Union, Kazakhstan saw uh, the importance of the Western market diminishing quite significantly. Although Kazakhstan sells as much oil to the EU as Saudi Arabia does, so it's a significant importance. And at the same time, in the last 20 years, when we look at wider Asia, we observe the rise of China. And as you would see, it's a particularly long way to go to export the gas and the oil, mostly the oil exported here, 
and get it on the, exactly the other side of the country into the, the, the People's Republic of China. So what they had to do, they had to build a very large pipeline network, which as you could see now, is reaching the People's Republic of China, which is now one of Kazakhstan's most important um, importer. So what do we have here? We have a country that is particularly oil-based, but also have a very significant um, role playing with its economy by uranium and other kind of uh, precious uh, earth, earth materials, uh, and a country that in order to reorientate its production towards China had to uh, undergo a particularly significant, a particularly extensive um, process of energy de resource development, either by uh, building this long, very, well, very expensive pipeline or by increasing its own uh, resources because uh, it's not that every oil is the same. One thing is that if you go and just dig a hole in Eastern Saudi Arabia, you probably get the, the oil coming out. But in this part of the world, especially with the Soviets having drilled Kazakhstan for almost, well, Soviet and the Tsarist Empire have been drilling Kazakhstan, oil in Kazakhstan, in Western Kazakhstan particularly for all, almost 120 years, you would realize that uh, the, prior usage of the, of the reserves were not always mm, well performed. So uh, there is a significant part of oil of field depletion, which means that they become weaker and poorer, mm, determined by uh, prior incorrect usage. So Kazakhstan, you know, we are not going to get into technical into this, but the, uh, the extraction of oil in Kazakhstan is particularly expensive because of geological and because of historical patterns of well development. But what you need to understand, what you need to rem rem remember for this particular slide is that um, even though Kazakhstan is particularly well uh, equipped with resources, the reserves are placed in the part of the country which is more distant and actually even less developed, if you want, from the current key partner, which is the Republic of China. So if we move to the next slide, we're going to see something very similar here. And it's so let me just move. I need to move. Yeah. And what we're seeing here is this is the case of Turkmenistan. Turkmenistan is, an, is a gas giant. They have the fourth largest uh, gas reserves in the world and are a significant export. But uh, in the case of Turkmenistan, the particularly authoritarian, the very isolation is the very unique, if you want, policy that has been implemented by the regime for the last 30 years. It's actually complicated even more the exit of Turkmenistan for the Rantia paradigm. So Turkmenistan has got a particular policy. The fields which you could see in the Caspian Sea, so on the shore, can be developed by foreign companies. And a lot of the uh, Emirati, if you want, companies are developing the field which I'm now highlighting over here on the left-hand side of the slide. When it comes to the onshore fields, or the fields that are inland, Turkmenistan is always forbidden the access of foreign companies to these fields because they were, they were scared that by having foreign companies, particularly Western companies, you will open up the country to globalization and will destabilize the particularly controlled uh, balance which we have in the country. So it is a deliberate decision. So if you look at the map, you will have, and let me just go again with the thing, you will see here, sorry, here, this pipeline, the Central Asia Center pipeline. This is what was built during the Soviet, Soviet Union. And this pipeline goes to Turkmenistan, then to Kazakhstan, and then get into, Russia, into the Russian Federation and brings gas, gas into Russia, Russia, Soviet Russia, and now the Russian Federation. And what does Russia do? Russia uses Turkmen gas to heat your homes and sells its gas, which is more expensive, to Western Europe so that they make more money, guaranteeing the population some security. This has been in between 1992 and 19, 2009, 
the only pipeline there was, uh, well, an exception, but we're going to go there. Was the principal pipeline to which Turkmen gas was expanding its own gas, which means that for 19, since 91, Soviet Union collapsed to 2009, Russia was Turkmenistan's only customer, only buyer of what was the most, well, the only product that Turkmenistan was exporting. So you would see how this is politically important. In 2003, there was this problem between gas renegotiation of the price deals at Turkmenbashi and Putin agreed for some prices, but the Russian community took many some suffered because um, the, the Turkmen government decided to abolish uh, dual citizenship. So all the Russian in Turkmenistan were lost their Russian citizenship. And there was this problematic exchange between what uh, the reality was on the field and what that and what they could do in terms of gas deals. But the price was finalized. So you can draw your conclusions here. Uh, the two exceptions to the Russian monopoly, you, again, I hear these two very short, one and two pipelines which go into the Islamic Republic of Iran. Iran would do the same. Iran would buy Turkmen gas and, and would use to power the economy of northern Iran, which is a very large border here. And they will then use the gas that is actually in the south to either power the south or to export. What's important though is that Turkmen, sorry, Iran does not pay in hard cash. It's barter. I give you gas, you give me uh, food. I give you gas, you give me cereals. You, I give you gas, you give me heavy machinery. So that kind of context, when you have an economy that is mostly based on the export of uh, of gas, it's not a very conducive, conducive situation. Now, 2009, as I was saying, is a watershed year because the one I'm circling now, this town of Tabar, which is called Galkinish in Turkmen, which means Renaissance, is one of the, the, is probably the largest gas discovery in the last 40 years. It's one of the largest in the world. And it actually, it multiplied Turkmenistan reserves potential. To expand this field, to explore this field, Turkmenistan made the very first onshore deal with a foreign company, allowing a China National Petroleum Company, which is highlighting in this map with this gray area, to have access to the development of the field, access to all of these microfields on the right um, on the right bank of the Sir Darya. And, uh, and in that sense, acquiring what is called upstream state, which means that if we produce together gas from a single field, we will divide the profits accordingly. That's a problem because we will see that in addition to exploring this field and to this field over here, Chinese workers also built this pipeline the Turkmen China pipeline, which goes through Uzbekistan, Kyrgyzstan, Kazakhstan, and then gets into Western China and Xinjiang. And now Turkmenistan is mostly exporting, well, almost only exporting to this pipeline because Gazprom withdrew, trade with Iran is not really strong. And what did it do? They actually are getting more and more export to the Chinese market. The problem is, that if you do have, uh, they sign an agreement in which uh, the money that China invested to build the pipeline was going to be repaid through the export of Turkmen gas. Which means that in the last 10 years, the amount of revenues that Turkmenistan was getting just by exporting to China has been decreases even if the actual gas has increased because they had to repay the investment that China did. So Turkmenistan, which is the most ranty of Central Asia, as is now exporting one single product to one single customer, which is not even paying. That has got a devastating Im impact on the Turkmen economy. Why? As I was saying before, all ranty estate at Turkmenistan in particular 
tend to have this very large system of subsidies. So Turkmen citizens never paid for school, sorry, electricity, water, rice, flour, uh, gas, of course, because the government was using the money they were making with the land to, to help them in that way. Then what happened? That when the revenues decrease to 2015 onwards, those people have seen their subsidies to be obliterated. So they're no longer there. So you're now working the same job, having the same wage, but unlike before, you had to start paying for all of these things, food, water, electricity. And this is not something which is sustainable by the population has generated the expansion, the, the spread of poverty, the spread of um, energy insecurity, but also food insecurity, because obviously the Turkmen are now no longer able to afford the same diet that they used to have. And in that sense, you see the country suffering very much the implication of this, uh, if you want, or this botch or this fame, Grantianism. So let me just now move to the next slide. I think we got three more today. And what's important is something which is very important because obviously, you guys live in Russia or say Russia at the moment, and you have this particular, uh, well, Russia is one of the five states that uh, is part of the, the Caspian Sea. So we don't really have, and this is a map that I've taken from the energy um, administration of the, of, the, of the US. And it's, we are not sure of how to divide up the Caspian Sea. So from North, to south, moving westward, you've got Kazakhstan, Turkmenistan, Iran, Azerbaijan, and Russia being the five, what they call in English, river state, the five states. That we are not sure because the five states have not reached an agreement, and the agreements that regulate the Caspian status are either signed between the Russian Empire and the Persian Empire, or by the Soviet Union and the Persian and Iran, which is important because you have in those years, you only have two states. Now you have five to, be, to deal with because the Russian Soviet Union disintegrated. And then they have not reached an agreement on how to use the resources. In international, this is, this is an international law issue. And you have these uh, different approaches, whether you determine that the Caspian is a sea or a lake and it gives you either shared ownership of the resources that are located in the in the sea or only exclusive use of those resources that are located in your sectors the difference is that there is not much of a problem for the resources that are based in into the immediate part of the sea so what they call the economic uh, exclusive economic zone but it becomes a problem when you have and i'm going to highlight now again um, issues like particularly here, where you have these fields that you are not entirely sure whether they belong to Turkmenistan or Azerbaijan. And I think that there is a problem here because it makes the whole uh, development of resources something which needs to be addressed. The first issue to address is that, how are we going to uh, transport these, resource, these reserves? And uh, because the markets are far away, especially, and this is particularly true for this Turkmen Azerbaijani is dispute between the different states, different fields. Uh, so far, we have not seen the development of an extensive, well, on any pipeline network in the Caspian Sea. And also, we have not seen the development of a functioning um, shipping network. The, the exception is done in this part between Kazakhstan and Russia. Uh, Astrakhan and, 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 and other kind of connect, connected. But we don't really have the same in this part. In fact, if you want to travel from between Baku and Tukmanbashi, which is on the Western coast, you had, to, you had to wait until the ferry is full. So you can be stuck in Baku for a week and then jump, jump across for a very unpleasant uh, ride. So to me, what is important about uh, the Caspian Sea is that unlike the one belt, one road, uh, which has kind of created a very, an image of uh, development, of progress, of lively uh, exchanges 
in the Eurasian landmass, the Caspian Sea is a very static framework. We don't really have easier transportation. We don't really have patterns to exploit the resource jointly. And uh, a recent document has somewhat tried to address this issue, the 2019 Convention of the, Rush of the um, Caspian Sea, which sort of uh, the, identify a pathway, a way, a pathway to join development. But it's always included a series of environmental clauses that may prevent in the long run the full development of the Caspian, of the Caspian resources. And also what we've seen recently is that there was an agreement in, um, in uh, between Turkmenistan and Azerbaijan to develop some of the spheres here, which they called uh, Doslik, which is the Russian word Dushba friendship there. And, uh, but we still haven't seen uh, substantive plans to uh, increase the export opportunities for these, for these uh, reserves. Not we know what kind of profit structure is gonna be regulating the development of these resources, if any. So let me now move to those Ramti states that don't really have an uh, energy resource. Let me explain what this graph does on the right hand side of the slide. Well, here you would see that uh, the, the larger your resource capability, the less inclined you are to use renewable sources, which obviously, and also, yeah, and also like all kind of poverty. So the more developed your economy in Central Asia, the least likely you are to use renewable sources. And this is something which we know because Uzbekistan, Turkmenistan and Kazakhstan are particularly carbon intensive economies. But uh, it tells you that there is a problem when it comes to, uh, well, two problems. One, which is Uzbekistan uh, so far flowed energy development. Uh, Uzbekistan uh, wants to be seen as an energy independent in a, in a small time energy exporter, but we've seen particularly recently that the current energy policy of Uzbekistan is not, is not only not unable to uh, create opportunity to the export of, of oil and gas, but it's also unable to guarantee an adequate, affordable and secure flow of energy to its country. So it's actually to its citizen, which is actually unable to guarantee Uzbek energy security full stop. The main problem though is that you have states, Tajikistan and Kyrgyzstan particularly, that do not really have any particular uh, hydrocarbon resource. So in order to guarantee the energy security, which is we'll see later becomes an, an, a security of supply, they have tended to rely on the extremely large scale, extremely non-transparent, extremely cumbersome, uh, projects to develop the hydropower. And of these, the most symbolic one is certainly Rogun, not far off um, the, the capital Dushanbe. So this is something which go, goes on from the Soviet Union. So Turkmen, sorry, Tajikistan and Kyrgyzstan are potentially uh, renewable superpowers because they have an incredible amount of water resources, of hydro resources that could be suddenly quickly generated uh, transform into a very significant source of electricity generation. The problem that in Central Asia, you have the, the, the states that are downstream, like Amudarya and Sidaria, the two rivers, the states that are downstream, they don't really have hydrocarbons, so they need water to electricity generation capacity. And the, the states that are downstream, Uzbekistan and Turkmenistan, have hydrocarbon, so they would prefer to use the water to irrigate the cotton monoculture, which comes from the Soviet Union again. They can never agree. So the downstream countries are discussing and they're developing this hydro generation capacity by creating this sustainable, well, this very large scale. Rogun is important because Rahmon, Tajikistan's president, has continuously highlighted the national building capacity of this program that is a symbol for, for Tajikistan. But what we've seen here is 30 years of uh, words, not a lot of action, but a lot of corruption as well. Uh, 
because the, pro the, the, the project is not finished, it's not close to be finished, and the amount of money that we spend in uh, the construction of this dam, the Morinista Dam, is uh, being wasted. So at the moment, we don't really have a significant, well, a sustainable, if you want, uh, progress, sustainable pathway for, and for renewable development in Central Asia. There are some efforts in Turkmenistan, sorry, in uh, Kazakhstan and Uzbekistan, beyond the, the two we mentioned before, to develop this kind of um, uh, energy, energy, so energy source. But to me, we are not really seeing any significant uh, plan for uh, carbon substitution. We don't really see the, the, Turkmen, the, the Turkmen states, the Kazakh state, but not even the Uzbek state, really engaging with the green economy in the way that they should. Because maybe for this generational leaders, there is not gonna be a problem in um, surviving with oil. They will not see the end of oil. But in two or three generations, there will be no oil left. And as a, as a ruler, as a governor, as someone who is in charge, you should have a clear idea about how to develop that uh, particular part of your economy. Which leads me to the final slide of today, if you can just wait for me for five more minutes, actually. And on the, on the, the picture here, this is the, the Kashagan um, oil, sorry, yeah, oil, uh, oil field in this part. I'm gonna go back to the map here. There you go, you can see it here. So this is what we see, this is what I'm writing here and what comes here. So this has been the most expensive development in the last 50 years. There was a lot of problems because you had to build artificial islands to develop this field, the largest coal into the years, and it's brought a lot of problems to the Kazakhstan government because the amount of rent generated from that particular field has never been in line with what the expectation were. So when we talk about Central Asia, energy security, which is what this seminar tried to do. We need to be specific about whose security we're talking about. First of all, Turkmenistan and Kazakhstan as oil exporters have to make sure that they ensure security of demand. There will be someone down the line who will be willing to pay more or less money, but it is more for buying Turkmen gas and Kazakh oil. Whereas when it comes to Kyrgyzstan and Tajikistan, which are the two most important, uh, well, the two non-resource rich country, it becomes security of supply. Who is gonna sell us the enough, enough oil, enough gas for us to power our economy? And this has not worked because we've seen constant blackouts in, uh, in urban Tajikistan, in urban Kyrgyzstan, but also in the capital cities. And uh, in 2010, the, one of the Kyrgyz revolutions, you did have the people really going into the street demanding energy security in a kind of grievance that was very similar to what we saw in Armenia at the time of electric Yerevan. So that's something which could impact. Then when it comes to this, the second point which I want to make is that are we talking about the regime security in terms of energy or the population? And here we have two probably uh, irreconcilable connection. Uh, if the regimes, Kazakhstan and Turkmenistan in particular, want to make money out of the revenues, the population is gonna be put in the second place. The population needs some kind of access and some kind of governance that regulates the, the energy rent in, in a more transparent way. So we usually end up having a separated uh, understanding of what energy security is for the regime and it's usually a security of rent versus what the population and security understanding, which is something that is much more based about having gas to cook, gas to warm itself, or even oil, uh, petrol to drive, uh, to go somewhere. And then you have the final bit, which is this uh, incredibly important division between a regional energy security versus a national energy security. These are five states that willingly or not, they share an ecosystem, they share resources, they share the rivers, they share the mountain, they share the, the, the irrigation system. So energy as part of the water energy food nexus with something which 
is a lot of stuff written on, has never been understood by the five central Asian states as something that can be approached, can be uh, tackled through our uh, collective uh, lens. So in that sense, energy insecurity becomes a security threat that rather than being dealt collectively has been treated individually, which means that when two states have oil and gas and three states don't, or two don't, the one is a little bit more, you really have this, this, this big question, how are we going to guarantee that we treat collectively this kind of security challenge? You, you really don't, because uh, you've seen the problems that Kyrgyzstan has had in importing gas to the Turkmen China pipeline, the one I discussed before. You've seen the cost of energy insecurity that is experienced not only by Tajikistan, which could be the rule, the norm, because they're energy poor, but also most recently by Uzbekistan, which is a country where you should have a sort of more secure energy framework. So and now I'm concluding, uh, what we've seen this week is something that goes beyond the mere, oh, Turkmenistan has got that many BCMs or Kazakhstan exports to this and that. We're trying to make sense of the next, or what is beyond energy policy in a way that looks at a different uh, point of view, which tries to divide between the leadership and the elite, which looks also at the impact and particular economy, particular energy choices has had on the different economies. And thanks a lot for your attention. I'm finished now. And if you have any question, I'm going to unshare my page so you can actually have a better way to discuss. Luca, thank you very much. That was a pretty interesting lecture. You wrote some interesting questions in the very end. So, dear guests, you are free to ask your questions. Uh, just a second. Uh, you can unmute your Unmute yourself and you have something to ask or maybe something to comment. You are free to do it now. Um, yes, I've had a, a few questions considering uh, uh, viability of hydroelectricity in terms of um, climate change. Oh, well, that's something very important. I mean, climate change is going to hit Central Asia very strongly because you have patterns of or sorry, desertification, you have uh, the, um, the glaciers that are melting, so you're going to have a significant depletion in water resources, particularly in upstream contexts like those of Tajikistan and Kyrgyzstan. So if you ask my opinion, they should create, and this is the five governments, they should create a permanent uh, body, some kind of multilateral regulatory body that as a total um, jurisdiction over how the water, the Sirdaria and the Amudaria are. Uh, done in a balanced way, in a collective way, rather than by saying, I want this much water, you want that much water. Because uh, obviously hydropower not only guarantees the rise of capacity generation in Dumps upstream countries, but also allows the generation, the creation of a truly shared electricity uh, grid, also an electricity grid based on clean electricity. Because at the moment, you don't even have a unified regional grid. So the, the southern part of Uzbekistan is connected with the Afghani grid, which, as you see, as you can see, Max, is not super safe. So yes, I would say that there is uh, there are two main ways of uh, tackling climate change in Asia. One, which is a contribution to a worldwide uh, program, which will be decreasing the emissions. But obviously, they can only do it if we do it in West and the US, especially. But also relying more and more not only on uh, the other sources of renewable, but also by focusing on having. Uh, cleaner capacity in terms of generation when it comes to the division of upstream and downstream states. All right. Uh, I'm not uh, pressed on time with these questions, right? Because I had a few more. Yes, no. sure. All right. And um, I would like you to elaborate on uh, political influence of China on these five states, because 
uh, a few rivers, for example, that run through Kazakhstan, they begin in China and China has complete control over these rivers. Uh, up to the point they can block freshwater access to Kazakhstan with uh, building a few dams. So uh, what are your thoughts on that? I actually don't know very much about this. Uh, my work has mostly focused on the pipelines. So I know what the, 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 the China pipeline uh, is done for the Turkmen economy. I'm not really sure whether that was deliberate for the Chinese government or the Turkmen government, which is what I hear much more often, got confused between investment and loan. Uh, in general terms, I don't really have a, a sinophobic approach to Central Asia-China relationship. I don't really think that China has got that kind of, uh, of a dominating uh, neo-imperial approach. Uh, I think that they just want to make money out of it. Uh, so I don't really know whether this, this, these rivers can be blocked. They probably can, but uh, also I don't really see that much of Kazakhstan rhetoric on the hydropower. I don't really see Kazakhstan uh, talking a lot about hydro resources. So I am not sure what kind of incident uh, the hydro politics, especially that shared with China, may have on long term or medium term stability of the Kazakhstan capacity of general electricity. All right. Uh, a lot of a lot have been said about um, hydroelectricity, but uh, what about other renewable sources of energy like wind uh, generated electricity or uh, solar panels, for example? Because um, most of these uh, countries, they have a very flat landscape and hot and dry climate. So could you? I, I actually think that there should be more attention to renewables particularly if we look at President's mid-year economic development plan in Uzbekistan. Uh, because I think that in Kazakhstan there is not the political will to convert um, away from electricity, sorry, for, from either coal generation capacity or from hydro, sorry, or from uh, hydrocarbons, or even, uh, yeah. Whereas in Uzbekistan you do have the potential. I haven't really seen much being done, but my understanding is that Uzbekistan has a significant, as you were saying, Max, solar generation capacity. So I would expect in the next five years, after the president gets re-elected, because that's going to happen, we're going to see, well, we should see at least uh, Uzbekistan developing not only the kind of um, oil and gas, um, oil and gas um, field here around Samarkand and Bukhara, but also the kind of significant uh, gas, sorry, uh, solar potential, which we will see. It's expensive. When, will they go with China? It's very expensive, of course. Will they go with China to support that? I don't know really sure, uh, because that would be another way to link up your economy with China. We know that Uzbekistan is some kind of uh, reapproaching or approaching path when it comes to the Eurasian Economic Union. But I don't seem I don't seem to, to know where there is no evidence that there is that kind of renewable agenda as part of the Eurasian Union. So my point is that um, I if I were to bet on one particular area in which that could be uh, you know what you were saying could be achieved in, in solar energy in Uzbekistan. Uh, something that comes to mind. Uh... When, when it comes to that point, is um, general viability of production of oil. Considering, like, for example, the last year when the price of oil fell to, to basically negative digits due to some uh, economic shenanigans on the market. Uh, like, How uh, viable is the production of oil for the economy of the country in the modern day and age? It's not. It's not reliable at all. I mean, Kazakhstan is usually goes uh, into budget parity when the oil price is over $65 per barrel. Uh, you know where, how far it has gone, and it's not going to go up in a rush. So uh, it is particularly uh, unviable, and they should really do something to reduce their dependency. But as I was mentioning before, when you elaborate on how Central Asia understands its own energy security uh, is done not only for the short term, 
very antheistic approach, but it's also done in relation to the power differential in the country, which means that the elite of Kazakhstan have decided that for their political support, for their previous sustainment, they can, uh, they have to rely on oil revenues because they're already there. And in that sense, they're not going to encourage any kind of diversification, which is exactly what you were saying. It makes it unsustainable, at least in the medium term. Uh, if it's not too off topic, uh, could you please um, give uh, examples of alternative uh, routes for Russia's energy production? Say it again? Just a short. Uh, a few alternative uh, options for Russia's energy production. Just to... for Russia. Well, I don't really know. I'm not an expert. Oh, okay. I know where where the fields are, but I don't really know the Russian system. No, I'm sorry. All right, no. then. Uh, then thank you. It, it was an excellent oh, lecture. Uh, thank you very much. And thank you for your questions. Uh, Luca, just for your information, I just got a message from Ahmad. He sent me two previous messages. Uh, he's saying that it was super interesting lecture and he's saying thank you to you. Well, actually, uh, I personally have a question, maybe just to uh, maybe just to summarize everything. So there has been a lot said about the differences in policies of different Central Asian countries. But maybe can you please summarize them? Are there any similar attitudes, similar approaches to their policy? Well, you have the big division, Isabetta, is the states that do have resources and states that do not have resources. With Uzbekistan in the middle, because Uzbekistan is self-sufficient and exports a little bit at times. So those that do have resources, Kazakhstan and Turkmenistan, they pursuing some kind of rentier policy. So they continue to base their own economy in on um, the exports of. The main issue is that, particularly in the Turkmen case, the economy, rather than becoming more diversified, is becoming more and more focused on the, the export of gas. And that's unsustainable in the short term as well. And then you go to the other side and you have Kyrgyzstan and Tajikistan that do not have resources and have not really agreed on a, a way to develop their own uh, hydro potential, which is extremely high. They could be in the top 10 in the world for hydroelectricity generation capacity. The problem there is that not only you have a poverty issue, the states are not very rich, but you also have a, a corruption problem, especially in, in Tajikistan, and you and not being able to create um, investment climates that would welcome Western or Chinese even companies to develop those sources because that kind of resources have got a particularly nationalistic national building meaning attached. And you would see that with the issue of uh, Rogu in particular. Uzbekistan in the middle, but it's a bigger state and population. And we don't know what they're going to do. I think we're going to look very closely how the energy development will be in the next five years. Okay, thank you very much for the explanation. Well, does anyone have some more questions or comments? You're very free to do it. Or maybe you want just to say thank you personally. Well, if no one is going to ask anything, I think that was uh, the information you gave us today was very useful and uh, some food for thought. Um, again, thank you very much for your time, for giving us the lecture today. And uh, next week on Tuesday, we continue, right? And we have our final I thought lecture. it was on the, on the 16th. Well, if you think it's due to the holiday, we have only Monday off. Uh, Tuesday is... Are you okay? I'm okay with that. Yeah. Man. Perfect. So next Tuesday, same time, same place. Um, we will send this information to all our guests from today's lecture. And looking forward to see you next Tuesday. Okay. Thanks, all. Bye bye. Bye bye. Thanks for the lecture. Goodbye.